for this one. Yeah. Uh, cool. Hi everyone, my name is Alan. Um, so I'll be talking about nuclear fusion and um, specifically moonfield nuclear fusion, which I think is a um, very interesting new technology that's being developed now. And um, you know, it always seems like it's 50 years away, but it's not really 50 years away. <laughs> Okay, so the energy industrial complex, so just a little background history. It seems like every time we find a new source of energy, you know, our technology, our growth, our research kind of explodes. So, you know, in the Stone Age, we had fire. Before that, it's nothing, so it's, <laughs> it's like prehistory. And then we found charcoal, and then with that, you can have smelting, and it's hotter, so you have metalworking, so you get the Bronze Age. And then from there, you get, you know, the Iron Age and stone, uh, the Steel Age. And then through the discovery of coal and then the research of coal and using coal, we get the industrial revolution. So from there, you know, everything kind of explodes and get trains, you know, steam-powered engines. And then there's um, oil. So that kind of brings us sort of today. So the 1900s, oil starts becoming one of the more popular fuels, and we know how that's going. And then there's nuclear fission. So around the 1950s, you know. Einstein and all those guys, they, they started um, doing this research on nuclear fission and you know, we have this power station now and generates a lot of power and it's really good. And now today we're working on renewable energy, but as many of you mentioned, there are problems with that, but it's a good step forward, it's reducing a lot of you know, the, the bad stuff, all the previous technologies we've had. So what's next? Fusion is the future. So E equals MC squared, that's, you know, always used. It's the same equation for fission, but it applies here. So <coughs> what is fusion? Fusion is the energy from stars. So you ta you're talking about solar power, wind power, it's like those are good sources, but all that energy comes as a derivative from the sun. So if you can just harvest the energy from the sun itself, then that's, that makes it a lot easier, a lot more powerful, efficient, and it's very clean and very safe very flexible and sustainable. So a um, 0.5 grams of the um, deuterium and uh, tritium, so isotopes of hydrogen, if you combine those fusion, you can get a 500 megawatt um, power station, which the land area to make that power station is about 100 acres. And if you want to use solar, that would take about 2,500 acres. So there's also the, the size benefit. And basically, if you crunch numbers, you're not going to run out of the uh, fusion fuel. It's not totally renewable, but we're not going to run out. So just a um, kind of refresher, what, what is heavy water, what is tritium, and what is helium-3? So deuterium is heavy hydrogen, and it's component in heavy water. So it's one proton when you're losing a lot of that really, really fast. And it's also radioactive, so it's not that great. Helium-3, it's very stable. It's helium, so it's a rare earth metal, or yeah, yeah, it's a really good, <laughs> it's really good, it's a noble gas, so it's really stable. And, um, but it's very, very rare on earth. So here's a uh, very complicated part. So if you look at the energies, if you combine deuterium and titerium, you can get about the, I think it's like seven, you can get like 17 mega electron volts. Yeah, so that's pretty good. So people are working on that now. Future technology, if we can combine deuterium and helium-3, can increase that up by a little bit more. And if we do helium-3 and helium-3, it's a little bit less, but it's a lot safer mm -hmm. because then you won't have to deal with um, titerium, which is radioactive. So it's not totally clean energy. And the problem with deuterium and helium-3 is when it combines, you also get, um, you get an extra proton when they fuse, so a proton is ejected. That proton sometimes combines with deuterium you get a second reaction and that makes titerium, which is still radioactive. So it's less radioactive, but it's, it's better. 
but it's not as good, but whereas just combine helium-3 and helium-3, very safe, non radioactive it's, it's good. So, current progress. So, as I mentioned before, it's not 50 years away, it's actually more like 10 years away. Um, ITAR, which is a European project with uh, a whole bunch of countries from all over the world, they're going to make a tokamak um, reactor in 2000. Yeah, so they already started construction in 2010 and they're hoping to complete it and actually start running it in 2019. So that's really soon from now. Um, if you don't know what tokamaks are like, these toroid um, chambers that magnetically keep the hot plasma in. And the uh, National Ignition Facility, which is in California, where I'm from, <laughs> they did a test last year and they actually were able to ignite, um, or I, no, sorry, they didn't ignite anything yet, but they're able to achieve the power needed to ignite a fusion reaction. So um, what happens in a fusion reaction is there are a couple ways to create fusion. One is through gravity, which is what the sun does. Just you have enough mass, and it just matches all the all the atoms together. And then you can use um, heat. So if you heat up everything, then you get all the atoms energetic enough that they start crashing into each other and start fusing. So that's the ignition energy that we're everyone's focused on using. And then there's um, I think there's another inertial way where you use the, uh, the accelerometers, and then you kind of crash things together, but that, no one's used to doing that. Alright, so the moon, okay, where does the moon come in in all this? So the moon was amount for like 10 times the amount of all the fossil fuels we have now, and 2 times all of our uranium now, so there's, there's a lot of potential on the moon, and um, I guess if you just use, that's where deuterium, helium-3, if you use helium-3, helium-3, then there's half that, but still a lot. So mining the moon. All right. Some people think this is crazy, but it's actually not that far-fetched. So we, I mean, in the 70s, we went to the moon and we came back with 380 kilograms of lunar soil. So it's been done before. It's not that outlandish. It can be done. And um, corporations now are actually looking into going to the moon and setting up lunar bases, manned lunar bases. So Big Low Airspace, which is a Las Vegas-based company, and they're planning have these inflatable modules that you plant onto the moon and you can have up to 12 people living there and um, yeah they hope to put that up in 2014 which is really soon and then NASA has completed work on the um, space exploration vehicle which is this and it's basically the new lunar rover and um, if any of you watched Top Gear James May was able to test drive one of these so it works um, NASA is also working on Robonaut 2, so they have this project called Project Morpheus. And project Morpheus is a plan to put a humanoid robot on the moon by 2013. <coughs> so in case we don't put manned people to mine the moon, we put robots up there. The so transport. Um, like I mentioned, uh, Project Morpheus, that's to put um, a lunar lander on the moon and a humanoid robot from the lunar lander. So Armadillo Aerospace is already been contracted to work on this lunar lander and it's really, really cool. If you guys seen the rocket lander, it's like a rocket that kind of shoots downwards and just floats down. It's really cool. Um, in November, Ad Astra Rocket, um, they tested the Vasmir uh, Ion Thruster, which is also really, really cool. It's, um, if any of you guys know what Ion Thrusters are, it shoots out really high energy small particles for thrust. So instead of shooting out tons of chemicals and uh, for normal chemical rockets, it turned out very small gas particles that have very high speed. So while it's um, you don't get the initial thrust, over time you get a very good, um, very cost efficient, and very uh, yeah, very cost efficient, and very fast thrust. So if you had these Vasmir rockets, you have them varying between low Earth orbit and lunar orbit. They're not actually landing. They're just going between the empty space, you can have a supply line that takes six months to travel one way. And if it's all robotic, then it can just continuously operate. And then, oh yeah, SpaceX. Uh, just a few months ago, they announced Falcon Heavy, which is a humongous new 
awesome, awesome um, chemical engine for rockets, and it's really, really cheap. So um, it, they can put up like one pound of material for only a thousand dollars, thousand U.S. dollars. Whereas before, nowadays, it take about hundred dollars to get a lot of jobs. Not only did it create a lot of jobs, it had actually a really positive economic input. So it sounds like it's bad, you know, spending all this money is wasteful. But actually, every state in the U.S. had an increase in boosting economy because of the Apollo project. Because there are so many new technologies derived, so like satellite TV, even the soles in your shoes, CAT scans, microchips, that was all from the Apollo project. So just this kind of research in itself kind of brings up a whole new other uh, dimension. And then the helium-3, if, for example, it was the silver bullet and replaced all the other technologies, so it goes away from the paradox, it, it would generate about $300 billion per year, which is a lot. And that basically means it would pay for itself and more. So challenges, you know, people are crazy. They think of the hydrogen bomb, you know, that's fusion, that's crazy. But fusion is actually really, really safe. For um, hydrogen bombs, what happens is you have a nuclear fission bomb that gives it enough energy to create fusion, so you get a secondary bigger explosion. But what fusion does is you contain everything in a magnetic plasma, and as soon as that plas if there's a breach in the system, that plasma cools, then all of a sudden fission stops. So and there's no radiation if you do helium three, so it's really safe. Space travel is too expensive. That's not true. If you actually start, you know. <coughs> producing the electricity from this fusion that actually pays for itself and all the research that comes with it. So the big picture will create ample clean and safe energy, um, create a lot of new jobs, um, a lot of new technology, and there's a cultural impact that gives a country a drive to achieve something more. So I'll just quote Carl Sagan, by exploring other worlds we safeguard this one. By itself, I think it is a fact more than justifies the money our species has spent in sending ships to other worlds. It is our fate to live during one of the most perilous and, at the same time, one of the most hopeful chapters in human history. And today, the foundation exists for freedom to be possible. In ten years' time, we might see that, and we've been to the moon, so that's possible. So, everything's good. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'd like to thank the um, the judges for listening, the audience for listening, and YGN and Nuclear Institute.